so yesterday we learned about uh, uh, chromatographic methods where uh, you know uh, we looked at um, three different kinds of uh, chromatographic methods ion exchange chromatography then gel filtration then affinity chromatography um where we saw how proteins from a mixture can be separated and individual proteins can be purified and then we also learned about um, uh you know the purification scheme how to evaluate and monitor the efficiency of purification you you know looking at the total protein content and the total activity and then how much of the activity we are able to recover at the end you know that's where we learned the term specific activity so today what we are going to do is we are going to look at another method which is primarily an analytical tool okay so the chromatography is sort of a preparative tool where uh, you purify proteins of certain quantity for further use of uh, electrophoresis also can be used for preparatory purpose where you can purify proteins but uh, that is really very small scale and its primary goal is actually uh for analytical purposes so we we'll learn about uh, how electrophoresis is use, used for that purpose in proteins so i uh, i'm sure most of you already know what, what is electrophoresis electrophoresis is basically a um, migration or movement of molecules charged molecules in an electric field okay so that is what is electrophoresis so in in biological applications what we actually do is we use a solid matrix okay for separating uh dna or rna we use agarose based uh, uh solid matrix and for proteins it is primarily polyacrylamide gels so the choice of the uh, matrix uh, depends on the kind of molecules we are separating and the size of the molecules for uh, larger molecules polyacrylamide gel is not very suitable because the pore size here will be very small and so therefore dna are not uh, usually separated using polyacrylamide although it's very useful for um, separating oligonucleotides and for uh, sequencing dna so where it's uh, this sequencing is done by synthesis and those synthesized New uh, nucleic acids are short oligonucleotides, but in uh, the case of proteins, polyacrylamide gels are the dominant uh, kind of solid matrix we choose. Uh, this is the primary way by which uh, electrophoretic separation of proteins are done. So, polyacrylamide uh, is a gel. So. it is a uh, made up of a monomer called acrylic acid and bisacrylamide and uh, these two uh, form a network like matrix polymer a bisacrylamide acts as the cross linking molecule that cross links long polymers of acrylic acid okay so that is the polyacrylamide gel um so this is usually the gel is made from solution of um acrylamide acryl acrylamide and uh, bisacrylamide mixed solution and to that we add um, uh, you know molecules that catalyze the polymerization and initiate the polymerization so by adding uh, those components then this solution turns into a gel once it polymerizes it becomes gel so in the case of agarose uh, it's long chain polysaccharide it's obtained from seaweeds and there uh, it is a powder form but when you soak it in water and hydrate it usually by heating um the agarose gets hydrated and swells into um a gel like constituency so that is how uh, that is made and um here um the primary you know property that separates the mixture of proteins into individual proteins is um 
by variations in the migration which is which depends on charge and mass okay so what what is the net charge on a given protein and how it compares with the rest of the proteins in that mixture as well as its molecular mass compared to the rest of the proteins and these two properties determine the rate of migration through the gel upon uh, you know in the uh, application of electric charge and the um, shape also matters because the pore size is going to have a certain diameter and if you have a long fiber kind of thing with a low diameter then that can migrate while a shorter protein globular protein with a bigger diameter is not going to migrate so shape does matter but we do a modification to the protein shape such that eventually in the most commonly used version of polyacrylamide gel what matters is the charge by mass ratio that is for unit mass how much charge is present so that is what is going to uh, determine and therefore it is actually the molecular weight the molecular size of the protein is the sole property based on which proteins are going to be separated in this um, a certain variation of the polyacrylamide gel so that is what we are going to learn now so so let me take you to the you know pictures that makes it easier to learn normally for agarose gel which is the easiest to make what we do is we uh, melt uh, we, essentially you measure out a certain amount of agarose powder you add it into a buffer which is primarily water but you need charged molecules to conduct electric current and therefore you have a buffer there uh, like this acetate edta um, so where the acetate ion is going to be the medium for conducting electricity so you add the agarose into that then you put it in the microwave and uh, heat it and then it melts and it dissolves into the liquid so it becomes clear liquid uh, essentially the long polysaccharides are hydrated in this heating process in with the buffer the buffer is primarily water so now when you allow it to cool then it slowly becomes a gel it solidifies and becomes a uniform gel so what we do is after melting we pour on a uh, acrylic uh, sheet based uh, a tray and in the tray it solidifies and you make gel so the shape of the gel depends on the shape of the tray so usually it's a rectangular uh, boat like structure uh, with the shorter dimension open then you keep it in a tank where you have the buffer added then apply electricity you'll have electrodes on either side of this uh, rectangular tray and when you apply electricity then uh, you have the current passing through the gel and if you have added a mixture of dna it gets separated so that is the simplest one so this acrylamide bisacrylamide polymerization the way we do is uh, shown in this cartoon on the left so here you keep uh, two thin glass uh, sheets like this is basically like the window glass so you have a glass uh, the top is notched like this the bottom is straight flat which is not visible which is which is sitting in this uh, trough and you have one more glass uh, sheet that is uh, shown here and the in between space um so it is basically this the, the the gap between the two glass plates is determined by a plastic sheet that we keep between the two and that is usually 1 mm to 1.5 mm so the the space between the two glass plates is about uh, that much you know maximum we usually use 1.5 mm and in uh, in some preparatory version they might use 3 mm what we commonly use for separation uh, to get a gel like what is shown in the right you use about 1.5 mm uh, spacers these plastic strips shown here they are the spacers so they are between the two glass sheets and in between space is where uh, of course there is a uh, 
space i put at the bottom so whatever you are pouring in the space between the two glass plates uh, that does not leak out and once polymerization is over the bottom one you will remove it so therefore you can have a tank here with the buffer and also top a tank with the buffer so then uh, if you have electrode on the top and bottom as shown here then electric current will flow through because the buffer in which this acrylamide is polymerized as well as the buffer on the top and bottom they have ions to conduct electricity now if the proteins are charged then uh, let us assume that they are all negatively charged then they will migrate towards the positive charge okay so this is how it is done so so here essentially instead of uh, melting something in buffer and uh, pouring in a tree and allowing to solidify solidify here actually it is a chemical reaction that makes a polymer from monomer so the monomer used is the acrylamide and it is not simply a long fiber it gets cross linked by the presence of this acrylamide that can uh, covalently linked uh, can covalently link on either side to two growing chains of acrylamide uh, polymer and this cross linked mesh like structure is what finally is the gel and mixing these two uh, does not activate the polymerization spontaneously you need an initiator and you need a catalyst and this is served by two molecule two compounds one is called ammonium persulfate and another one is called temed temed is an abbreviation of a long name so you can look up in the book later so once you add these two to the solution of acrylamide and disacrylamide you mix it and before it solidifies you cast the gel meaning you pour that liquid between the two glass plates and you will keep a comb like structure here a plastic comb with the tooth and uh, after it, uh, it solidifies if you remove the comb you get these uh, shapes which we call as the well and that is where the protein is loaded so usually the protein solution is mixed with uh, uh, glycerol that increases the density therefore it doesn't diffuse into the buffer instead it goes and settles at the bottom of these wells and to visualize the solution as well as its migration you add a colored dye so as it migrates you can see that so once the separation is done then you open up and take it out and soak it in a, a solution that actually what we call as fixing so it fixes the proteins the proteins no longer diffuse uh, after separation and they remain in position on the gel then you add another solution where usually you have a colored pigment or a dye that is specifically bind to the protein and once that that process is, is called staining first you fix the protein to the gel so that it doesn't diffuse while you are staining because it's all in liquid okay so then protein can readily diffuse if it is soluble in in the aqueous buffer so the fixed separated proteins when you stain with the dye then the dye binds to all the proteins so that process is called staining then you wash with a solution that uh, removes the non specifically bound dye non specifically bound all over the gel and only the uh, dye molecules bound to the protein or uh, stay there that helps you to visualize the proteins and such a gel is what you are seeing on the right here so here uh, you have uh, so these these are called the molecular weight markers or molecular weight ladder because it appears like a ladder so these are uh, reference proteins whose molecular weight we already know and some of them are covalently linked to a different colored dye like for example this appears brown because it's already pre stained marker so the, the to visualize these pre stained markers you actually don't need to do the 
uh, staining and washing, de-staining process. So they are visible even while migration happens. Okay. So here, uh, what I have done is I have lysed uh, bacteria, so the E. coli bacteria that we normally grow in the lab, and separated on the gel. And each protein appears as a band. Okay. And uh, so this is uh, stages of purification. So we see here, um, this is an E. coli stain that is uh, genetically engineered to produce a certain protein. And that is this protein here, you know, this is present here, not in this. So this is normal E. coli that doesn't produce that protein. And this is one, this one is producing that protein. And I have used an affinity chromatography to purify this one out. And you see here, this pure protein is visible while most of the others are removed. And uh, I have, in this experiment, what I have done is I have checked whether uh, my cloned protein, genetically engineered one, is it being produced? And if it is being produced, am I able to purify it out? And in which fraction the pure protein has come? And you can see here, one, two, three, fourth, fifth, sixth fraction contains my protein in binding to the column washing and diluting that I described yesterday with respect to affinity chromatography. Okay. So this all looks cool and nice. Um, but I told you in the previous slide, we primarily separate the protein based on the molecular weight alone. Okay. So given that, so see here you have the real wells, you know, this is the cartoon and this is the well. After I have removed the comb, you see these wells in which proteins were loaded. Okay. So, um, Given that it is charge-based uh, mobility, you know, in electrophoretic field, the charge will matter. And at the same time, shape also will matter because you have pores of certain uniform shape and diameter. So a long rod will have a narrow dimension than a shorter big ball. So therefore, shape will matter. So we do a certain modification to this basic simple gel such that um, these two are no longer an issue. The shape is made uniform for all proteins and similarly charge is also made uniform for all, all proteins. And that modified version is called SBS page. Okay. Um, so the, here I'm going to explain that in detail. And before I go into SDS, I want to explain one more detail about this basic polyacrylamide gel. So this page stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Okay. Uh, so in the most common method that we do where the separation is purely based on charge by mass ratio uh, and when charge is constant, therefore it is only the mass that matters. There, what we actually do is we boil the protein in a buffer that contains this ionic detergent, uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate, okay, SDS. So this is a strong ionic detergent. What it does is it um, opens up the three-dimensional structure of the protein and that process we call as denaturation, okay. So denaturation is the process uh, by which the three-dimensional structure is uh, disrupted and all molecules assume same rod-shaped structure. And that is because this SD is based on its strong uh, charge. Uh, it binds to the uh, amino acids um, at uniform uh, a ratio, okay, so X number of SDS molecules per Y number of amino acids. So the number of SDS bound is directly proportional to the length of the polypeptide chain. So, and the charge pro provided by the SDS is a lot more than the charge the, on the protein and uh, due to that, the net 
charge of the protein is negligible and the final charge is actually the negative charge produced by SDS. So after this treatment, the charge of a protein depends on its size because its size determines how many SDS molecules will bind. So therefore, if you take a ratio of the charge by mass, that is going to be constant for all proteins. So this is the treatment we do so that the shape of the protein and the inherent charge on the protein um, do not affect the separation. And the separation is only based on molecular weight. So this is one modification. And second, years ago, a scientist by name UK Lamelli came up with a very ingenious way of making a polyacrylamide gel. So in this, what he did is, basically this gel is, uh, his uh, invention is to uh, circumvent a certain uh, uh, difficulty in resolving the proteins that is uh, due to the fact that we make this narrow uh, sheet of gel. Okay. So the gel is made between two vertically held pla glass plates that I showed you in the previous slide. And this is done uh, due uh, primarily to avoid exposure to air because oxygen in the air interferes with the polymerization of the acrylamide. It gets oxidized to acrylic acid. As a result, we pour this gel between two glass plates. And due to that, it is a thin uh, sheet of gel and to load sufficient volume of any liquid, the here sufficient volume of what I mean is I'm talking in the range of 10 microliters to 50 microliter volume. So this is going to be a long comb like structure. So you can see here it extends some more. It's usually about a one to two centimeter uh, depth well. So now when you add liquid, let us say the liquid, um, let us take this one, you know, this is a uniform shape. Suppose if the uh, liquid fills this much and when it is homogeneous, the same protein molecule will be present here, 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 everywhere to up to the top. So you have a column whose uh, height is about one centimeter, let us say. Now when the protein solution migrates, it will be an one centimeter column that is migrating. So a given molecular weight protein is present all through this one, uh, one centimeter column. So every band will be exactly the same height of the original amount of liquid or original column of liquid that was there. So due to that, you are not going to get this fine, sharp bands like this. Okay. So look at that. This well was filled, but this protein is only a sharp band. So if it is going to be wider like the original size, then next one, next one, all will overlap and separation will not be good. Okay. So this problem or this limitation is primarily because you are making a thin gel between two glass plates and that is because you want to prevent exposure to air. And to overcome this problem and increase the resolution, what UK Lamelli did was he introduced a modification and that we call as the discontinuous polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So here, what is discontinuous is there are two things that are discontinuous. One, you see here a line and this line is because I poured originally a certain concentration of polyacrylamide uh, mixture here and allowed it to form a solid uh, gel there. It solidified and made a neat uh, gel with a sharp, straight, flat line here. Okay, so don't worry about this. This one is not another separate gel. This is the migrating front. That's the electrophoretic front. So the molecules, the fastest molecule that was here when I applied has reached here when I stopped the gel. Okay, so here no molecule had come to. So um, 
this discontinuous is because I poured one gel of a certain concentration. So he, usually the concentration here is higher. In this particular gel, it is 12% gel, meaning 12% of acrylamide, disacrylamide in uh, basically water. It has some buffer to allow ion uh, for current, but primarily it is water. And then I poured another gel on top of it after keeping the comb. So in that gel, I have the comb shape formed. So this gel is a low percentage gel. Okay, acrylamide here is about 4%. So here the pore size is larger. So the size is definitely not going to matter in this. While the pore size is smaller and here size is going to matter. So there is a discontinuity in the gel pore size itself. So that is one thing. In addition, here the acrylamide and bisacrylamide I mixed in a buffer which had a pH of 8.8. .8. Okay, it's a higher pH. And here I have used a lower pH, 6.8. So there is a discontinuity in the proton concentration, hydrogen ion concentration as well. And the buffer used for making these two gels is Tris HCl. Okay, Tris is the base and HCl is the acid group here. So we simply call it as TrisCl, Tris chloride, or TrisHCl, or whatever. So, and once this is done, it is mounted on tank. There is one tank on the top, one tank at the bottom, and the electricity is applied. And the tanks are filled with a buffer, and that is going to supply the ions for continuous uh, passage of the current through, electric current through this. And that buffer is glycine okay so he, here the pH is 8.3 okay so pay attention to all these values these are all important and these all directly connected to the pKa concept that we learned so now when you apply electricity when this tris glycine uh, you know this is a weak acid it is not going to totally dissociate while chloride would have completely dissociated and when you apply current, the chloride ion will move very fast. Okay. So there is a set of molecule, molecules that are moving very fast at the bottom of the gel. And on the top, the partially dissociated glycine enters. But it gets right away protonated because the pH is low here. So it starts to move very slow. And due to that, a voltage gradient or potential gradient is set up in the gel and that makes all the molecules move fast and line up here at the junction between the two gels. Okay, the voltage gradient created by the difference in the pH between this and this and the molecule chosen and its pKa value. So, this glycine is pushed down because there is a potential gradient which is actually going to apply a lot of force down but it doesn't move because it doesn't have charge and as a result it all get concentrated in this junction and that is how while all the liquid has moved all the protein molecules have all concentrated as a narrow band here now once they slowly enter here they quickly get ionized because the pH is high. So now glycine gets uh, ionized and now it starts to move uh, uh, steadily. And at the end, once the, all the chloride ions are gone and it, it is all simply 8.3 pH all through because due to the continuous flow, these two are going to get disrupted. Then you have a steady movement of the protein molecules as short bands. So, this whole drama is done primarily to concentrate all the molecules in that taller column of liquid into sharp band at this junction. Okay. It forms at this junction primarily due to the pH difference and the pore size difference. That is why it gets concentrated here. So this is the basic principle of discontinuous uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So this gel can be used without adding SDS as well. 
But when you add SDS, we call it as SDS page. So I, I told you the sample, the mixture of proteins is boiled in SDS and therefore the protein is denatured and then you have a certain uh, you know, number of uh, SDS bound to the protein and the number of SDS molecules bound it depends on the uh, length of the polypeptide chain. So with these two modifications, uh, we get a separation like this. Okay. So I, I hope uh, you have understood this concept quite clearly. This is very important because this will keep reappearing in biochemistry or in doing experiments uh, in multiple contexts. So therefore pay attention to remembering the basic uh, uh, chemistry behind the SDS page. Um, so if you look at this gel, you probably be able to count about 100 bands in this. So it's in the order of hundreds. So ma maximum, if you increase the length of the gel some more and uh, allow more theoretical plates and um, uh, you know, uh, increase the percentage and so on. And when you increase the resolution, probably you can go to 300 to 400 bands and that itself is a stretch. Normally it is under 200 bands that are identifiable. So any normal eukaryotic cells, like cells of our body, make about 20,000 different proteins. So obviously there will be multiple proteins that are of the same molecular mass. And as a result, a band that you see here like this may not be a single protein. It may be a mixture of proteins. So you want to separate them as well. Okay. So for that, we move on to another kind of gel. Um, so this is the sodium dodecyl sulfate. This structure is no threat to you because you already know free fatty acids, you know, long oliphatic side chain we know. Instead of carboxylic acid group, you have a sulfate group. Okay. So this is sodium dodecyl sulfate. So, so this is how the separation happens. Okay, another important point that I want to point out is the distance migrated is directly proportional to the log of the, um, sorry, inversely proportional to the log of the mass. Okay, so y axis is log and x axis is the distance in centimeters usually. So, if you measure and plot, if you know the molecular mass of these reference proteins, the molecular weight of an unknown protein can be readily determined. There are other more sophisticated methods, but this is the most practical and reliable way of determining molecular weight of proteins. Okay. So molecular weight uh, may uh, be affected by other, uh, sorry, the shape, everything will uh, affect certain methods. And there are sophisticated methods like ultra centrifugation where you can, uh, the other factors like size, shape, none of them influence and you accurately determine the molecular weight. Um, but for most uh, practical purposes, this SDS page is the easiest and practical way of determining molecular weight. And usually it's very accurate. Okay. So you measure the distance migrated by your reference and plot on a semi-log uh, sheet. Then you look at the distance uh, your unknown protein has migrated and then you, from that graph, you will get the molecular weight straight. So if this is the distance it has migrated and look at here, what is the uh, log of the molecular weight. So from that, you get the molecular weight of the protein. Okay. So this one, you know, readily without even plotting by knowing the sizes, you can tell, yeah, this is somewhere between 30 and 45, probably about 40 KD protein. So this is an important um, application of SDS page. So now to circumvent uh, this issue of not being able to separate all proteins, uh, we you we exploit two distinct properties of proteins. So here we are exploiting the molecular weight uh, differences among the proteins for separation. Then we already know, depending on the kind of amino acid sequence a protein has, its isoelectric pH can be varying. 
and I told you isoelectric pH is the uh, isoelectric point or pi is the pH at which a protein's net charge is zero which means that protein is not going to move in an electric field if the uh, gel pH at that given position equals its pi so that is not in no way related to its molecular weights it is a completely independent distinct property so that is exploited in separation and such a electrophoresis is called isoelectric focusing okay so this isoelectric focusing focusing means it, it my the protein migrates gets focused at the pH on the gel where its charge is zero meaning it's uh, that pH equals its pi so you are actually focusing the protein molecule mo molecules of that particular protein from different parts of the gel to that particular place because up to that it will migrate then it is going to stop migrating so this method separates the proteins based on their pa and this is usually made in a tube gel so this is called a slab gel because it's a slab like structure a sheet and uh, this one is made in a tube so tube do not uh, imagine a test tube here okay so here we are talking about um, capillary like 200 microliter capillary or something like that where the diameter of the lumen is in terms of uh, millimeters okay so one millimeter or less than that um that sort of a small tube we are talking so here the polyacrylamide is mixed with um a group of molecules called ampholytes so these have different kind of charged uh, moieties on them such that when they are uh, distributed they generate a ph gradient okay so for example in this particular cartoon we have a gradient of ph 9 to ph 3 now when you apply proteins what they do is they migrate uh, it can migrate in both directions okay because it depends on the net charge on the protein you have not um, uh, saturated it with um, a, a molecule like SDS so then net native charge only is there so now they migrate on this gel and stop migrating when they reach a pH where um, that pH equals their pH so it creates bands like this along the um, high pH to low pH now uh, using a thin needle inserted between the glass and the gel and gently pushing some water through it you can extrude this gel out okay the tube will come out and that tube what we do is place it on an SDS page slab gel okay so here the comb is like a flat single plastic sheet and therefore it will make a single big comb and in that space you push this um, tube into it and now you soak it in SDS uh, buffer and this is of course made in SDS buffer although the line is not drawn in this this is discontinuous gel just like the one that I uh, showed you here the discontinuity is there the uh, exactly it is normal SDS page that we just learnt uh, elaborately uh, except that the comb is big to fit this tube now you apply current now what happens all these bands get concentrated here and they are denatured and they now separate based on the molecular weight and each of this the band uh, in a cylindrical band here when it gets concentrated it becomes a spot and if that spot has a mixture of proteins of different molecular weights they get separated and that is what you are seeing here okay so all dots in one vertical column 
they all come from they all started together because they all have the same pi and therefore they were in one band and they are in different rows now when you look horizontally that is because their molecular weight is different and by doing this instead of seeing uh, you know a couple of hundred bands now you see uh, about a thousand to th two thousand spots and this is called a two-dimensional electrophoresis okay first dimension is separation is based on pi and this method is called isoelectric focusing and the second dimension is uh, based on the charge and that is sds page so this isoelectric focusing coupled SDS page is what we call two-dimensional electrophoresis. So this technique is very powerful in separating the protein molecules. In modern times, the technology has advanced well enough that we can uh, generate uh, reliably identical patterns um, reproducibly when you repeat with the same sample. And uh we have the ability to excise out a given uh, spot and uh, uh, identify what protein that is and doing this kind of a thing is a bedrock of uh, an approach modern approach called proteomics where you study all proteins of a particular uh, cell or an organism um in one go uh, like genomics it is proteomics so this two dimensional electrophoresis is one of the really powerful techniques of proteomics okay so uh, this completes our discussion on the protein based methods so there are many more methods we are not going to get into all the details this kind of gives you a flavor of what kind of things people do with proteins okay so next what we are going to do is we are going to i'm going to open a different uh, powerpoint so here our goal is to how do i find out the amino acid sequence okay so what is in one end and what is next and what is next it's a polymer and i would like to know all the amino acids in the sequence they appear in in the given polypeptide chain okay so sequencing a protein so that is the topic here so a long time ago frederick sanger found a way to determine the amino acid sequence okay so he got a nobel prize for that and then uh, several years later um, he again found another uh, breakthrough sort of method that is determining the nucleotides in dna okay and for that he got one more nobel prize so he's one of the few scientists or maybe the only one i my memory is not sure who got two nobel prizes unshared and his life is very interesting and inspiring so i, I urge you to go to this link and read about him okay read about the scientist so this will appear here and there when i describe certain specific discoveries pertaining to a uh, a certain scientist who contributed immensely to the field of uh, biology okay so sanger is one such um, scientist so please uh, when you have time go to this website and read about sanger so now what is the sanger's method of sequencing proteins um so essentially what he does is a protein chain has an n terminal residue meaning at one end of the chain the amino group of that amino acid at that end is not linked to any other amino acid because it's the end there and that amino acid that has the free amino group that is the end terminus of the chain so this i told you already and the other end will have the carboxyl group free that we call c terminus so the end terminus amino acid is derivatized using a reacting uh, reactive group here the group that we used is the fdnb uh, this is a uh, fluorodinitrobenzene okay fdnb uh, this group is strongly reactive with this amino group and it gets covalently linked 
Now you break the peptide bonds by adding six molar HCl and boiling. Um, then you all amino acids get, uh, you know, the peptide bonds get hydrolyzed into individual amino acids. Now you identify uh, the amino acid that is the derivative with FD and B. Okay. So, because this amino acid is going to have this group which does not e exist in the normal polypeptide. And from this, you know, okay, this particular amino acid, whatever be the R group, is the N-terminal amino acid. Okay. So, this is how you can identify the N-terminal amino acid. And then by doing a partial overlapping cleavage in a very laborious way, you can identify the subsequent amino acids as well. But to make it a lot easier, to ensure only the N-terminal amino acid is cleaved at a time, uh, Edmund came out with a method called Edmund degradation. So this is the method that is currently used for sequencing uh, proteins, if at all protein needs to be sequenced. Most of the time now we directly translate from the coding sequence of the nucleic acid because nucleic acids are a lot easier to sequence. And based on that, we determine the amino acid sequence purely by theoretical translation of the triplet codon. But if a particular experiment demands that the actual protein is sequenced, and for that, the currently uh, used automated method uses this chemistry called Edmund degradation. So here, instead of FDNB, he uses phenyl isothiocyanate okay so this is cyanide and an oxygen would have been cyanate and since it is um, sulfur so it is thiocyanate and it has phenyl group so therefore it is phenyl isothiocyanate or commonly ptc so ptc forms an adduct with the amino uh, amino group and then through electron flow indicated by these arrows it cyclizes and forms this carboxyl group gets hydrolyzed this peptide bond gets hydrolyzed and that forms a link with this sulfur and uh, this is the thiazilinone uh, derivative of the n-terminal amino acid and this can be separated and this hydrolysis is done by trifluoroacetic acid instead of boiling with six molar HCl, this is a milder but effective treatment for this cleavage and the cyclization. So now this uh, derivative can, can be identified while the rest of the polypeptide chain is left intact. So this is a polypeptide chain that is shortened by only one amino acid. Now this you can purify and repeat the process again and by doing this, uh, the sequence can be done. So these are usually done by fixing the protein first to a solid matrix, okay, a disc-like, a paper-like matrix on which the protein is added and this is at the bottom of a tube. So the solutions are added, a reaction happens and then you elute this molecule out, then you wash it and the shortened polypeptide is still there in the matrix, then you add again. So like this, a machine can uh, repeatedly do this cycle and each of this that comes out can be separated by a chromatographic method and uh, based on the absorbance, you can get the peaks and based on the distance migration, you immediately know what amino acid that is. Okay, based on the re reference uh, distances migrated by known amino acid derivatives with the PTC. So this is how the proteins get sequenced uh, in modern times. So this is Edmund degradation. The primary improvement over the Sanger's method is in Sanger's method, uh, the entire protein gets hydrolyzed into individual amino acids. Okay, so that is uh, laborious to go to find the second one, third one and so on. On the other hand, this uh, PTC adduct formation cleaves only the N-terminal amino acid leaving the rest of the polypeptide chain intact and ready for a next cycle. Okay. So, I'll stop here with the amino acid sequencing. Then tomorrow we will see how do we do the opposite. Like if I give you a mixture of amino acids and if I want you 
to make a polypeptide chain having a certain sequence, how do we synthesize that? Okay. We don't artificially synthesize a whole protein having few hundred amino acids, but we can make uh, peptides having 20 amino acids or you know, oligopeptides of that range uh, chemically can be synthesized. So we will look at that tomorrow.